Well, hello again, and welcome to Spotlight. Today is we're going to be talking about the USA as a world power, and uh, our guests today are Leo Graham and uh, Kevin Kunt, and I'm Ralph Pace. Now, to be specific, what our topic is going to be, has the USA reached its pinnacle as a world power? And like many uh, nations, empires, and regions uh, before it, it's facing a future where it will gradually slide into a secondary position on the global stage. Okay, gentlemen, why don't we begin with some spe uh, specific area. What's going to be the impact of migration on our future? Immigration or migration? Well, immigration. Okay. And um, well, I'll answer the first broad question that right. you you, you answer, and asked. And no, we are not in that same category. We are a country, I believe, that is by either d design or by luck. Uh, will be able to keep itself going for a much longer period of time than we anticipate, or than the doubters would think at this point in time. Okay. Now, Leo, what do you think about it? We are, as Kevin sort of alluded to, we're blessed by geography. Um, we have two broad oceans on either side of us, and historically we have not had um, powerful neighbors to our left, or to the north and the south. Canada, lovely place, but not a great world power. Mexico is, Mexico is a danger because it's increasingly becoming a failed state. And a failed narco state on our southern border could be extremely problematic. But uh, as of now, it is still, it's no kind of existential threat. Okay, now, is the uh, effect of the technology that we're uh, experiencing now, things like streaming, um, is that going to have any, any uh, impact on our own future? I don't think it will have an impact on our future. I think it will have an impact on the way people react and use their audio capabilities or their audiovisual capabilities. Um, I mean, it's hard to believe uh, that here, I'll just pull out and show that everybody doesn't know that that little cell phone that we carry around in our pockets right now uh, has more capability than the Univac, than 10 Univac computers that uh, helped to build the atom bomb. Uh, it's absolutely unique. We should not be worried about artificial intelligence. Uh, it would be almost in the form of being a Luddite if we were to do something like that. Okay, well, Although yeah. we are Ludlowites, we are not Luddites. Okay, but I don't. I don't want to get into now the uh, in, in, uh, t talking too much about AI because I think that's a whole different topic. Okay. Uh, but um, Leo, do you feel about? Well, it's certainly we are interconnected in a way we never have been before. Not just with each other, but indeed the globe. Uh, you can stream. You can talk to people pretty much any place you want to for nothing. And occasionally, I do use this as a telephone. <laughs> uh, but, um, well put, but the, well put. But despite the interconnectedness of it all, it doesn't change the basic geography of two great seas on either side of us and uh, weak neighbors to the north and south. That doesn't change. Okay, well you don't think we should merge with Canada so we, we can add 26 cents Well, you know, we tried it once in 1775 and again in 1813 <laughs> and the Canadians didn't want to play. And, and we're rather um, rather vocal about it. Well, of course, a lot of people don't realize that, that Vermont did come sort of close to becoming part of Quebec. Well, Ira, <laughs> Ira Allen, Ethan's brother, did try to work a land deal. It didn't quite happen. Well, it's, fortunately, it didn't happen. But Okay, now, this is going to be something that... Uh, I have always considered very, very important. And uh, you'll pardon the, the phrasing of this, but this is my own idea. It's, what about the unwillingness of the, pop, the population to get their hands dirty? Go out and do things like um, farming. So I think the Industrial Revolution has changed the way a lot of manual labor was necessary. Uh, you can look at the automotive business and how that's changed over the years. That's a perfect example of when it took probably 
30 people to build a car. If you were to divide the, mm -hmm. the hours up, it probably only takes five people to build a car now, simply because of the way uh, it, industry has been able to change and make things that were done by hand or to get your hands dirty, as you said. Uh, even if you're a welder today, you have to have more technical knowledge than just the guy who used to weld in the past. He has to know not only how to utilize that welding tool, but he has to know what the metals are that he's mixing together, how is he going to uh, make it smooth, uh, and he has to have everything is basically run by computer. Okay. As late as 1920, half of the American population lived in rural areas, effectively engaged in agriculture or supporting it. Uh, today, fewer than 3% the American population are How is that low now? No, no, no. Where's well, that when you say it's population? Are you referring to the, uh, the population recognized as citizens uh, versus the population recognized as immigrants? Right now we're talking about citizens. If you want to talk about, about immigrants, legal and otherwise, in the dairy, in dairy industry particularly. Uh, I lived here 25 years. I grew up in Wisconsin and live there now. Uh, where, again, the dairy industry in either of these states would not exist without immigrant, mostly illegal labor. They simply wouldn't exist. Okay, well, now what, what about farming? Uh, Just g general farming, you know, corn, soybeans, grain, wheat. 3% of, of the recognized American population, legal, whatever you want to call it, is engaged in agricultural pursuits. And yet we grow uh, more food than ever. We're a massive exporter of food. Um, it's our largest export. Yeah, having driven out here, um, you see the, the farms in Vermont, and indeed in Wisconsin, the states are so similar. Or you see these kind of hard scrabble farms carved out of uh, rock and hillsides, and you wonder, my God, how? Well, I also drove through uh, large swathes of uh, Indiana and Ohio coming out here, where you can, it, the land is flat for as far as you can see. Literally the tallest thing on the horizon is a tree or a silo. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know you've come to a town in the distance? You see a clump of trees, a church steeple, and a grain elevator. <laughs> that's that, true. That's the, old, that's the highest thing around. And so acre after acre after acre after mile after league is dedicated to agriculture. But it takes very few people to do that now. OK, and let's get to talk about something that's very close to this, uh, and that is uh, have we failed to resume manufacturing at a healthy rate? And when I say manufacturing, I'm not talking about assembly. I'm talking about actual manufacturing of, of a product. So uh, give me an example of that. Is that putting a washing machine together or? Uh, well, like, uh, all right. Are you talking about take, 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 Taking a refrigerator and, or a washing machine uh, and manufacturing it from from nothing until it becomes a finished product. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what and the major input into a lot of that manufacturing uh, over the years has been labor, and that's why we lost our manufacturing base here in the United States uh, because it was <clears throat> transferred basically to the countries that had cheaper labor than we do, and that is any place almost excluding the United States, and. As we become more industrialized, I think more and more manufacturing will come back here into the states. And I think there's a recognition uh, that we are, are, from a political point of view, want, do not want to be beholden to other people. Uh, and that is the press, I think, of both probably the Republicans and the Democrats, is to try to bring more manufacturing back here into the United States. Well, okay, one of those prime examples of that right now is the, uh, uh, the so-called um, development of um, chip manufacturing. Right. Exactly. Yeah, ship building but, is um, interesting. <coughs> it's, interesting it's, a, it's something that we, did, we were the world leaders, and then we ceased being the world leaders. Well, earlier this year in Marinette, Wisconsin, a shipbuilding industry, a shipbuilder put a lake freighter 850-foot lake freighter into the lake. It was the first lake freighter constructed in 50 years. <laughs> well, Shipbuilding in the United States is simply collapsed. Um, the United States Navy cannot produce ships 
fast enough to replace the fleet now, much less grow it. Uh, for example, submarines, which are extremely complex things to manufacture, and still take a fair amount of human labor, and very highly trained at that. We wanted to build two attack submarines a year. Well, we're building about 1.2 a year. Um, the country that, the exception to that really is Germany, which is a highly uh, organized economy. The labor market is highly unionized, very effective at gaining workers' rights. Uh, and they are a major exporter of complex machine tool, both the machines that make tools and the tool things themselves. And uh, they do just fine. Um, the United States economy per person, if, if we produce like Germany does, it would look like 1945 all over again, when the US, 1945, 40%, 40% of the entire manufacturing capacity of the globe was in the United States. Yeah. So how, do you have any idea of what that percentage is right now? Under 10. I'm oh, sorry? Of the whole world? Yeah, under 10. You think so? Yeah. Mm, okay. I wouldn't have guessed that low. Look at China. Oh, that's true. They've, they've expanded dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't believe that they were that, that large a, China, a factor. But also 1945. No, I know. 45 was a, we yeah, were on war footing. Yeah, yeah the, the, the EU didn't exist. Or, right. So all, all that stuff. So, yeah, 45 is admittedly a skewed year because, of course, the American economy is going to be huge. The second economy in those days was the uh, Soviet Union. Yeah. <laughs> well, because, again, yeah. the, the war economy. But Okay, now, to, you know, talking about that, are, are we at a level where we're, labor is pricing itself out? It depends, I guess. Um, that, as I said, was the major factor in moving most manufacturing out of the United States was the labor cost. It was just so significantly cheaper than it was to be able to do the same thing here in the United States. I mean, the, the, the cotton mills or the cotton manufacturing uh, of the southern, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia area was just obliterated. The furniture business the same way uh, by having the final assembly being put together. The machines cut all of the pieces of wood and manufactured, uh, but the people were necessary to put the clothing together and to put the furniture together. Mm -hmm. Just couldn't match the price. It was virtually impossible, even with all of the shipping costs involved in that. So how are we going to deal with that in the future in terms of competitiveness? Well, I, I think that it will be uh, probably what's happening to a greater extent now is that the Yuan, if we want to call it the the one or the the Chinese currency, is um, devaluing, or the, they it costs them more to produce and to get dollars back, or to get dollars for yeah. it. So currencies are taking care of part of it, and machines are taking care of the balance of it. We have a more, or we can have a more highly educated system to be able to run the machines because it requires. Uh, at least a high school level graduation, and sometimes even more in specific uh, industries to be able to produce stuff. So where do we get the people? They're going to have to be trained. That's one of the things that uh, it's education. It goes, it goes back to what is our education system and what are, how are we trying to develop it towards the manufacturing economy, if we are at all. OK. Well, do you think this? Uh uh, the production of uh, uh, the, the cells uh, is in itself uh, a forerunner to something else that's going to happen in the future in terms of the government supporting this type of uh, manufacturing, recovery? I hope, not. I hope not. How's that? Okay. Why do you hope not? Well, I prefer to keep the government out of any kind of industry. They've never been very successful. Okay, but they, they're, 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 less, very, they're very much involved in this. Uh, oh, I understand that. Understand that, and that, you know that's just not true, Kevin. No, no. Let me say one thing: when we're on a war footing, uh, the, the government has an important place in the uh, in the economic stream of manufacturing. We've never had, and if you can name them for me, maybe I'll be impressed. Is what is the, the government good at manufacturing? Pharmaceuticals. 
Well, you're going to claim that the, the U.S. in its way to develop the pharmaceutical business is in concert with the government, with the private enterprise, but they can't, they don't produce it. They don't produce pharmaceuticals. They did until very recently. The CD, the, the, for example, the salt vaccine, polio, those were government laboratories that they produced it, discovered it, and then produced it. Uh, all kinds of analgesic, all kinds of uh, anesthesia, all kinds of penicillin, antibiotics, things that, uh, that modern industrial pharma doesn't want to, they can't claim they can't make enough money. As a result, there has not been a uh, newly licensed antibiotic in this country in 40 years because the government got out of the business of producing them because we were told that the government was evil and couldn't do it. Well, they did it for decades and well, uh, and, and world leader <clears throat> well. Okay, well, uh, no, I, I think we're getting into a topic that uh, deserves to be its own little okay. topic, okay? Now, just as, as a follow-on to what we are talking about, though, this, have we become ec economically uh, enabled to vigorously compete in the national, in the, in the global scene? I don't believe so. Well, now, how are we doing it? Um, by ingenuity and by the use of what we call the capitalist system, uh, where people make money and they're incentivized, uh, it's worked pretty well for us over the years. Okay, you think it's going to work, continue to work well for us? Uh, yes, as long as the government stays out of the way. Well, the government's way in the way. The government is in the way because they have enabled certain classes of capitalists to prosper, and they have crippled, if you will, um, other groups. For example... Um, you, made, you, you made my point. <laughs> no, well, the, the, the oligarchs aren't paying, aren't, aren't paying their fair share in taxes. They're raking in all the money. Well, they, they, they look at things and say, well, well we're not going to go any place where there's a union because those damn union men. That's so not the reason why they say not the damn union men. It is certainly. You, it's you, want, because to explain the, why, you want to explain why Boeing's in South Carolina? Sure, not because it's the damn union men. It's because they're able to use right to work laws that allow men to do something, men or women, to operate in labor without being part of a labor union, which has. As, as history dictates, has been one of our most corrupt uh, organizational systems. Right to work, marvelously, marvelously propagandized word. Because it's not the right, the right to work makes it sound like workers have rights to their jobs. No, they don't. It means no. quite the opposite. No, it, it means they have no rights to their jobs at all, no, it save what they are given. It means they have the right not to choose the union. Okay, now. Have we reached a uh, point where our national debt, the severity of that debt, uh, is, is reaching a breaking point where the rest of the world is going to react to it? I'll let Leo go first. Okay. When Clinton was president, he ran budget surpluses year after year. The Treasury two, Department two actually, year, yeah, actually, two years. the Treasury Department actually came up with a plan to retire the national debt. Uh, now, what is it, bonds? They stopped selling bonds, for example. Uh, since then, in the arguments that taxes are evil, pure evil, and ultra evil, <coughs> the tax rate, particularly on people making lots of money, has gone down dramatically over that time. So we are running deficits so that uh, rich people can pay fewer of their taxes. We do not have a debt problem, we have a tax problem. The United States taxpayer, on the average, pays less of his or her income in taxes than any of the G20 country, any other G20 country in the world. The second lowest taxed nation in the rich club is Canada, by the way. Uh, you know what the tax rate was in 1955? The, the number one tax, the highest tax rate? 94%. Who was president? A Republican, Dwight David Eisenhower. What's the highest tax rate now? It's in the 30s and no one pays it. And it was also the same. Nobody paid 94% either. Uh, there the, were very, very the, fewer loopholes. The, the, the problem we are facing uh, is one of monetary use, or what you're looking, looking at, is that 
we have continued to increase the percentage of national debt that is part of GD GDP, the gross national product. Okay. Um, and we have, that has come from approximately, in the same time period Leo is talking about, from about 40% of the gross national product to now almost 100%. And that does not include the debt that is, in theory, owned by the uh, Medicare and Medicaid trust funds. So our problem is that we're going to have a much more difficult time financing ourselves. And uh, we'll run into a problem that nobody will want the debt, or there's a potential of that Everybody's going to always want the, the US government debt because we still are the only AAA country really capable of producing uh, enormous amounts of revenues, and those are the taxes that are collected. Uh, so I, I think it's more of a monetary problem that we're worried about, and I think that's the, the fear that I have, is that it gets that high and starts to continue to go above the 100% the level. My okay, first, well, my first serious girlfriend was the uh, daughter <laughs> of a CPA who did federal tax law. And uh, he was good at it. And he had a picture, and this would have been in the middle 70s. Uh, he had a picture in his office of the federal tax code when he started. <laughs> and it's a bookshelf. And he took a picture of the federal tax code in the middle 70s, and it was a wall. Now, all of these extra codes and books and things, they are not recipes and formulae for paying taxes. They are recipes and formulae for not paying taxes. So the ways out have grown more than exponentially, and the ways to keep paying your taxes haven't. So we now have, and that, that was the middle 70s, I bet he's got, well, he just died. But I bet by the time he was done, there were three walls full of ways to not pay your, pay your taxes. The tax code is uh, a joke. Uh, it is almost non-understandable. Well, I can't imagine, and I can't imagine not anyone understand. understanding yeah, that right. tax code. It, it, I, I, I consider myself relatively savvy in terms of understanding stuff, and I still have somebody else who works with me on my taxes, just because if you've ever gone just through a 1040 form, it's absolute idiocy. It's how, not how to count the cows in the field. They have you count the cows in the field, count the legs, count the horns, and then divide by four or six, depending on whether four, <laughs> five, or six, depending upon whether there's one horn. And it just makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, I would be for a much simpler tax, that we'd have three categories or four categories, and you reach certain levels or you blend into reaching certain levels, and you start paying taxes according to that basis. You have no deductions whatsoever, uh, that the government uh, funds every, it would, this would be the simplest thing, we just collect money on income, uh, that's it. And we would, if we had a 25%, I don't know if this number is still as true as it was before, but if everybody paid 25% of their income, or rev any income, didn't care whether it was capital gains, uh, whether you robbed a bank, or it was, you had to claim that income, it would produce more revenue than the current tax code does today. Okay, well. And it would be so simple. Well, Leo, what's your take on that? Well, the so-called kind of flat tax strategies, what you're talking about, generally speaking, the economics that indicate that if I'm making a billion dollars, 25% of a billion dollars is a whole lot of money, but it leaves me with Massive amount of cash. No, I said there'd be there'd be there'd be sk slides. It would slide up. It would be to fill in the progressive rate. You'd go from somewhere. Let's just use it for numbers. Twenty-five, or we'd yeah. take a lower number, fifteen, and it runs all the way up to forty. So that if you make a billion dollars, you got to pay forty percent. Let's just say for a number, right? Yeah, it's actually it's not a bad number. Uh, <laughs> it's about the right one. Um, that is, that is worth a debate, um, as long as percentages are 
percentages <laughs> are, are, are sometimes uh, misleading insofar as that you say, well, you're going to pay 7% of your income in this. Well, 7% of a billion dollars is a lot of money, but it leaves me with a swimming pool full. 7% of $50,000 is less money in total. I'm paying fewer taxes, but as a percentage, but as a chunk of my leftover income, it, it bites rather more deeply. However, the, the graduated thing, it, it is absolutely worth a conversation. Uh, of course, we'd have to figure out what to do with corporate taxes as well. Um, and I'm not sure corporations kind of end up paying taxes at the end of the day. Uh, we, we've got a fairly substantial corporate tax rate, but I'm not sure it ever gets paid. And surprisingly enough, and I forget what the percentage is, I believe it's less than 20% of the total tax revenue in yeah, corporate yeah. tax. And the number of the thing that's really interesting is the number of corporations, large corporations, that don't pay a tax. Well, that's because they have loopholes <laughs> or well, we're stuff that's that built in. And, and there would not, none, the simple tax would just have a straight corporation tax. You have earnings, you pay taxes on your earnings. That's it. Okay, and let's talk about something that uh, I can consider as associated with what you're talking about now. And that's what, what is the, uh, the impact of special interest groups on this whole process. Now this is for both in terms of basic you know, rights, but equally on monetary policy. Uh, special interest groups are uh, just what they say they are. They have their special interests that they are trying to either lobby for or twist people's arms for. Uh, I don't think you can abolish them. It's, it's part of the way we operate as a country, uh, unless they're breaking laws. If they're breaking laws, and we have laws that restrict them from what they should be doing. Okay, no, you, you don't, for example, uh, if you have a special interest group that um, uh, simply wants to abolish taxation, uh, what's going to be their impact on us if the Congress starts uh, paying attention to them well, and incorporating uh, some of their thoughts into legislation. I think that most people would recognize that the capability to abolish taxation wouldn't work because you'd have no revenue to run a government. So uh, if somebody had a special interest like that, um, I think most people would recognize that uh, it had no capability to be successful. But they could try, and I would think that they're there has to be a there, there has to be a revenue stream from the for the government to run. You know, let's pretend we're in 1912 again. I think it was 1912, <coughs> three years either way, <coughs> when the federal income tax 15 15 I believe. came through. I thought it was before the first World War started, but the constitutional amendment required to get the federal income tax, and it passes. Imagine that conversation today. Now, special interest groups aren't going away because the First Amendment roughly guarantees mm -hmm. their, their ability to exist. Done deal. But imagine the hewing, the crying, the squealing about that. And prior to that year, the federal government ran principally on um, import duties. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and minor taxes on things like whiskey. Um, but import duties. Uh, we certainly couldn't run the federal government that way today. Uh, but imagine trying to pass a federal income tax in today's, imagine. Well, we would have never gotten to where we are without a federal income tax. We needed some, the, the government was expanding at the same time the government and started moving to do, we as a country started to grow population wise, the government started to grow along with it and we needed a way to finance that that was much more certain than the import duties alone were well, you know, for excise taxes. Abraham Lincoln imposed a federal income tax during the Civil War. The Supreme Court said nonsense, and he told him to go jump in the Potomac. <laughs> uh, Lincoln had a certain amount of the great despot about him, there's no question. But um, So he collected an, an illegal federal income tax to pay for the Civil War. Uh, and you know, we did lots of things during the Civil War. For example, the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in the middle of the Civil War. Um, we were flush. So we couldn't have fought the First World War, or God knows the second, without 
federal income taxes. And there were many fewer ways than not payer taxes in those days. Okay, so, now let, let's let's uh, sort of <clears throat> sort of switch to a different aspect of this whole question, uh, and that is. Um, What's going to happen uh, to our military, and how does that affect our position in the world? Uh, China for, and North Korea, for example, have got huge armies. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe doesn't have much of an army at all. Um, we seem to be the bulwark f protecting them. Uh, are we uh, overprotecting everyone? Well, that's a tough question. I, I'm not sure there's a correct answer for it. Uh, simply, people would like to avoid war and avoid armies, uh, and they become sort of self-defensive if the other guy's going to spend that much money on his uh, of his budget on armament. I'm going to spend the same amount of money uh, on the armament. So I'm not quite so sure either ones are correct, either the ones who build greater ones or the ones who don't build enough. Okay. You think you, there's a fine line you have to draw, and for some reason or another, some people seem to think it's somewhere between 2 and 5 percent of our economic output should be d devoted to the armed forces or to the military in that combination. Uh, I don't know what we are right now. I think we're around somewhere around 3 percent, aren't yeah. we? Yeah. yeah. Somewhere around 3 percent. Um, so it's not a significant amount, but it's not an insignificant amount of our gross national product. Um, and the recruiting has become very difficult, as you're all aware. We went away from the draft back in 1980-some-odd. I can't remember the no, no, number of years ago. Was it 73? <clears throat> the draft? I thought it was still I was a lot, I, I was the, I graduated from high school in 1974. I was the last class to have a draft number. Okay. But okay. there was no draft. So we went away from the draft to a volunteer army. And uh, the, the last few years, they've had all, all parts of the, uh, the military have had a tough time recruiting, uh, meeting the needs of the personnel coming in and the personnel coming out. Well, how much do you think of the military might of a country plays into the power position of that country. Oh, significant, obviously. You know, just from a perception point of view, uh, you know, what's our great emblem? Don't tread on me. You know, so we're going to have, you want to come fight? We'll, we'll be here. We, one of the things we've been relatively lucky for, for and I think uh, Leo was sort of talking about, we've never really fought a war here on our own country's basis, with the exception of the Civil War, which was between ourselves. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is both of the oceans being there, defending us, and the fact that we had a military that if they ever got here, they would have a very difficult time. So we were able to export our military all over the world, and essentially really, uh, without the U.S., uh, the World War one or World War II would not have been won by either side, and we would have not have succeeded. Okay. Well, what's curious is, if you look at the way the armed forces is put together, the, the Navy and the Air Force principally are in charge of protecting the borders, and the Air Force is really the two things. Air defense of the United States is reposited in the National, in the Air Guard. Their job is air defense of the USA. The United States Air Force is an expeditionary unit. The United States Army is an expeditionary unit. Defense of the homeland in the homeland is the business of the National Guard. It is the National Guard. They had different names for them in those days. That's what we used to fight the Civil War, not the regular Army. Um, so that the Army, which is the largest of our three services, is also the only one that is purely expeditionary. For example, it's illegal in most all circumstances, save grave emergencies, for the United States Army to get involved in anything. Well, you know, riots, uh, civil disobedience, whatever you want to call it. You know, they nationalize the National Guard because mm. we can't put the... So we've got 450,000 active Army troops and we're having trouble recruiting, you're right, whose, whose job has very little to do with the continental United States, whose job is purely expeditionary. Uh, the Navy clearly protecting the shores. The Air Force cut into two branches, so you could argue that we defend, that just defend the nation, not project power, defend the nation, 
with our Navy and uh, the Air Guard, and the National Guard, of course. Now, no one's really thinking about doing that because being late to the party, pardon the expression, both uh, World War I and the Civil War, pardon me, World War I and World War II, they were near-run things. We, we damn near didn't get there in time. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, in 1940, the United States had an army of, what, 140,000, smaller than Portugal. And when it was all over, we put 14 million men and women in uniform. Um, it was an astonishing achievement. Um, so we want to keep a big army for that purpose. But the army, is a, it's expeditionary. It has nothing to do with defending the continent of the United States. That's yeah. the job of the Navy. Now, has, has the nature of uh, the, and purpose of the military changed significantly in terms of the, uh, the number of people required for it? For given the um, uh, the various weapons that we have that don't require people, I, I think it probably has, and we have not, thank God, been in any major conflicts, even the ones that we call minor conflicts, uh, where it has not been weaponized more than it's just the simple military uh, going in and, and having troops stationed there. Uh, the, I guess Vietnam was the real place where we lost, the last play, real place where we fought uh, a conflict on the ground. And we had, we, after World War II, we had Korea, then Vietnam, and the others have been skirmishing battles. And I think uh, it, it's, it's more of a mechanized system now than just n numbers of people. Okay, now, there are a couple of things which um, are going to be real difficult to measure, but one of them is the rise of other nations to replace the United States as the power. For example, uh, I think we would all agree that China very definitely is a rising power. Uh, now, how much it's going to rise is, is another question. Now, how do you feel about uh, that, that question about the uh, other nations replacing us? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that it's both a political and a, an economic question. And, and the, the Chinese, by, I believe, adapting very well, as no other communist country has, to the capitalist ways or by incentivizing has been able to be enormously successful. Uh, Japan, uh, who we fought a war with and who we helped rehabilitate, uh, when the 1980s started to commence, Japan was taking over the world. Uh, they inflated their market. They inflated uh, real estate values here in the United States. Uh, their market collapsed, and they have not been able to take over the world. I don't know if that same scenario will play out with the Chinese, uh, but it, it would not surprise me. You know, it has been recognized that if China got its act together, uh, it could be the world dominant power. And this has been recognized for a long time. The British were certainly aware of it in the early 19th century. And you know what their solution was? It was clever. They imported this thing from India up the uh, Pearl River into the heartland of China, and it was called opium. <laughs> and they, hundreds of millions of Chinese became incapacitated because of an opium addiction, for which the British fought not one, but two wars to maintain their ability to do nothing more than import opium to China, and to weaken them, which they thought was in their economic best interest, and undoubtedly it was. Rather a cruel way to do it, but there you have it. Now, perhaps, uh, with Xi, the Chinese do sort of have their act together in terms of manufacturing. But they're starting, oddly enough, to run out of people. The wrong way. Yeah, the wrong <laughs> way, exactly. And, and their population is aging and not being replaced. And a, million, a billion four, I believe, is the population yeah. right now of China. And it's anticipated, I believe, by 2050 that it will be potentially breaking back down through one billion. The other country that we didn't mention, who Leo made reference to, is India. India yeah, is India, doing yeah. just the opposite. Uh, they are a democratic, 
quote, quote. <laughs> uh, country uh, who is going the opposite way and is going through, I, I forget what their population is right now. Right but now they're larger than China. Are they? Right? And so it's 1.4 billion and it's going yeah. up. It's not, they're not decreasing in numbers. And, and it is a major industrial manufacturer. It's basically the pharmacy to the world, especially on uh, non-covered drugs. Uh, that's if you ever, ever look at where, the pharma, where, where they're produced, they're produced either in China or in India. Okay. What's interesting is both India and China tried one-child policies. Right. And the interesting thing was in both cultures, sons were so uh, valued that hundreds of millions, tens of millions of, of uh, female fetuses were aborted, right. not males. So in both countries, you're dealing with between 60 and 100 million in each country, men who will not be able to find mates. So, and some sociologist types think that that is in fact a, a more dangerous recipe for war than anything else. That roughly you, you will have <laughs> a class waiting to be militarized. They, they can't do anything else. So one of the, the, the great jokes or funny parts of uh, when, when India was promoting the one child uh, or small family, they used to put posters up on bulletin boards and it would be a show of great, great looking family with only one child. And there were other people would look at it and say, isn't that a shame? Look at how wealthy they are and they only have one kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work. OK, now just one final question before I open it up to whatever you, you gentlemen would like to discuss. And that is the historic precedence that no nation can continue forever as the leading world power. And uh, I can't think of any world power <clears throat> in history that has uh, achieved that status of being able to continue beyond a certain point. So from a philosophical point of view, assumptively we were saying that the United States is the world power and the leading world power. So we have really no comparison because they are, we are still in that role right now. So we could go on, we could go on forever. I can't see into the future. Uh, if there was a potential of any of those countries that did it in the past, I think we, and the ones who are doing it now, we have the best chance to be able to do that. Okay. You know, the blessed by geography thing really can't be overstated. Right. The, the, the two great seas on, on either coast are, are really amazing. No other empire in history has that kind of um, protection. What, you know, uh, Rome, when, when they expanded out of the Italian boot, uh, they kind of openly <coughs> ran into um, what people called hordes and things like coming out of Eurasia, the Mongol, uh, the, uh, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Huns, by and go on. And eventually they migrated their way right through the Roman Empire. And you know more about that than, than yeah. most people, Ralph, I think. Um, <laughs> certainly Britain was too small a country to rule a quarter of the world's service, but they had the Industrial Revolution. Everybody caught up. Like, you know, once, although there were still curious things, Basketville, in Ver does Basketville still exist? I'm sorry? The, the business Basketville up down in Putney. Oh, no, I don't think so. No, I don't. But they did for a long time. And, but one of the things that Basketville learned back in the early 80s was that they could send the raw materials. So they can say it's, it's Vermont wood to China, have the baskets assembled, sent back to the United States, and sell them for less money. <laughs> <laughs> and manufacturing. Oh, yeah, and, and the, 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 this is how Manchester got to be the great uh, weaving power. They could take um, raw materials from India, make the chintz on industrial looms in Manchester, send it back to India for less money. Uh, and so the recently dispossessed the crofters were busy making paisley, we call it now, and sending it off to uh, India for less money. Um, their standard of living was quite horrid, but so far, we got a little late in the game for the Industrial Revolution, so we missed the genuine horrors of it. It was bad enough in the shirtwaist factory, but 
the real horrors of it. And um, we were blessed by geography. So there was no particular reason that the nation can't go on as long as we can replenish our uh, younger population. And I will, I'm living long enough, and I may even live, when a name like Rodriguez or Gomez was going to be just about as foreign as O'Brien. <laughs> and, and that is how the Republic will endure. Okay, now, gentlemen, we've, I think we've gone through a lot of the major issues involving this question, but uh, can you think of any other things we should be talking about? Well, I think we covered a pretty good base here today. Uh, you know, one day we will, we will learn to use narrower brushes, but we did a good job with the broad ones today, I think. <laughs> okay. Agreed. Okay, I don't know if we've solved any world problems, but the, well, how would you summarize all of this now, just in a couple of sentences? Well, I think the fun part of uh, one producing an, or doing a show like this is that you get <clears throat> a variety of opinions uh, and a variety of agreements on, uh, on certain things. And the intelligent thing that we do is have a discussion without I don't know, too much screaming or too much yelling and are able at the end of the day, and when we finish the show, to sit down and have a drink if we wanted to have a drink or a chat. And well, I, hope not you, I, I hope you brought something. <coughs> not try to kill each other. Uh, the, the thing that you didn't want us to really talk about and I'll just make reference to was it was great when we had the Simpson Bowls uh, production of a way to go move forward. It was a guy who was a uh, a guy out of Wyoming who was uh, uh, as uh, uh, red uh, as a redneck as you could absolutely be, and a guy who came from a Carolina. I can't remember where he came from exactly. Uh, Bulls, and they were able to produce a, a product less than fifty pages that made sense. So much sense that it wasn't implemented. <laughs> well, no, I, I think you and I agree on that subject, Kevin, but uh, Personally, I think, now Leo. I think the greatest risk to the Republic is probably going to be climate. I, 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 think, it, I, I think we've actually made a real, we're on the way to making the place we live on livable. And I tend to think that uh, no matter how proudly the United States Navy sails the seas, if those seas are boiling, it's not going to matter. <laughs> okay, now if I just were to throw out the comment, uh, we seem to be a nation that likes to talk a lot, but doesn't like to act a lot. Well, I don't think that's true. Well, what about climate control? Well, climate change is or climate control or climate change? Well, you can call it either one, right. uh, we, change or control, whichever. Well, Climate change is something that happens and takes place. Yeah. <clears throat> and it can be caused by natural influences or, or influences imparted by man. Yeah. And the part we're trying to manage right now or understand is what is the influence of what man does. And it appears that it can be rather dramatic. Uh, so is climate, is there climate problems? I think very simply the answer is probably yes, there are. But how do we get to solve all of those problems? That's the, if you have the answer to that, uh, the, here we can do whatever we want in the United States. And we're just talking about controlling emissions. China, as a country, uh, produces more emissions, <coughs> excuse me, from their coal-fired plants than we do, just their coal-fired plants, yeah. than we do in the entire United States from all of our energy facilities. So as hard as we work, doesn't mean we shouldn't be working towards it, but as hard as we work towards it, this is not something that we here in the United States can solve by ourselves. It has to be done not necessarily in coordination with other nations, but letting them be aware that they have to change. Now, do we enforce that by war? Does climate change cause a war? I don't think so. but. Why not? We've okay. had sillier things. Well, I'll tell you what, gentlemen. Why don't, why don't we have a little discussion about climate change sometime in the future? Let us go. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. Now, just a quick summary of, about your reaction to the question of this, this topic. Of climate change or the, you know, the original? About, about the United States' position as leading world power. Uh, I think we will continue uh, to be the leading world power for the foreseeable future. Okay. Leo? I think, I think that's correct. There's no, 
there's no systemic reason why we can't be. You know, there was a systemic reason why Britain could not rule the world forever. It just wasn't big enough. We are. And, and, and there will be an interesting issue. Okay, well, that's an interesting summary. And I think, you know, based on that, we're just going to call it a wrap because that's about all that uh, I think we can say on this subject right now. And I want to thank Kevin, Leo. Thank and, you, Ralph. Uh, thank you, Ralph. And uh, we'll be seeing you sometime in the future. <laughs>